where you talk to Eric Cross, the Heisman Trophy winner, the pride of Omaha, it stops. Now, wait. Did you know you ran over Eric Reed? So, Ed Reed, yeah. Ed I did. Reed, did you know Ed that? You, oh, oh, yeah, I remember Reed. that. Trucking. Now, that's, that, that's what I want to talk about now. Eric, how, how good was that Miami defense? Mm-hmm. Because they had some superstars on that defense. They had Vince Wilford, um, Jonathan oh, yeah. Vilford, Ed Reed, Sean Taylor. Oh, they yeah. had a, 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 a fast defense. Now, I, I know the game didn't go like you wanted, but tell me about that defense. I mean, they were they were athletic. They were fast. Um, and, you know, they, uh, they had a special year. They really did. I mean, they didn't make a lot of mistakes, too. I mean, on offense – they had such a good old line uh, that their offense would, you know, would, would put them in good positions too to win. And not that the defense didn't have to do a whole lot, but they, you know, they were very, very good as well. So, I mean, overall they had a, a, an outstanding team and, you know, I take my hat off to them. They had a lot of great players, a lot of speed. They were well coached. I mean, I mean, you can't argue with a lot of those guys, they, you know, draft picks. I think 33 of those guys on the team were in the first three rounds and you've got hall of famers and pro bowlers. I mean, I think I had I think I had a tough you know that was that was a tough day for all of us. Yeah. Oh, you off that off, when you ran him over, we didn't score off that. I know we needed to put up a few more points. Well, we had we had a few turnovers. I I fumbled early, which was uncharacteristic. Um, you know, a pass went through Tracy uh, Wistrom's hands, and I think went for a pick six. Uh, threw a little bit of a high ball, um, but. I expected Tracy to catch that one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to ask you. Not most your, of the ones I threw all over the place anyway. Your weapons at Nebraska, if it, if it, it was third and nine, and you had Bobby Newcomb and Matt Davidson, I guess it's year 2000. Bobby Newcomb and Matt Davidson, um, yeah, you know, Tracy Wistrom at tight end, Wilson Thomas. Yeah. Who, 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 who would you trust the most to throw it up to? Uh, what's, what's the, uh, well, I mean, Matt had great hands, you know, Matt was going to catch anything you threw to him, no matter what, really. I mean, he could find a way to, I mean, obviously, I mean, the, the, the catch at Missouri, I mean, that, that one right there just tells you the guy can focus in on finding the ball. So if I had to say third nine, who, who I'm going to throw to, um, probably Matt. Kaiji, Matt Davidson. I mean, basketball player, um, a guy that could do multiple things, but as far as possession receiver, He's probably one of the best to do it at Nebraska. Yeah. Possession wise. He was actually sneaky good at getting open too. Cause mm. I mean, he was just, you know, he, he was kind of deceptive. Um, you know, he did run like a four or five electronic. Mm-hmm. And so I think people, um, you know, it didn't look like he was all always running that fast, but his ability to make cuts running, looking like he was running full speed. I think so it's deceptive to backs too. Like, if you can't tell a guy's coming out of his break, then you know you're already a step behind. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I, I think Matt was able to do that pretty well. Yeah, and and, and like a, a, a lot of people, Matt could jump. Mm-hmm. He could jump, you know, and he had great body control. And and you got to go back to '97. Matt, Bobby, Matt was one of two true freshmen. Well, more than that, it was a yeah. lot of true freshmen that played in your class that played as true freshmen. Yeah, Real Bobby. Buckhalter, mm-hmm. Bobby. Bobby Buckhalter, um, Matt, Matt. I don't know. There might have been one other guy. Guy to beat somebody else in your class was. Uh, what about defensively? Mm, I don't know if anybody defensively got it. Erwin Sweeney, Erwin Sweeney, Erwin, Erwin. There you go, Erwin. And, um, and and there might have been a couple other guys. I think Joe Walker technically was a freshman, but he had been on campus. I think yeah. he was about forty-eight. But technically, he was a true freshman at the time. That was his first yep. year of eligibility. So there was a lot of you guys that played. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that 97 class was as good as they get. Getting back to Coach Solich, because I felt like Coach Solich got a raw deal. I felt like um, – I felt like – and I want your – I want to know what you think on this one. I felt like Coach Solich was so good at running back, being a running backs coach that if he had maybe let Coach Gill be the offensive coordinator, you know what I mean? And it, 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 I'm just looking at it from what could have worked. But I want you to talk a little bit about that and then talk about maybe what your – do you feel like Coach Solis got a, a, fair, a, a fair deal at it? 
And what do you feel like would have happened if he was still been here? Well, I don't think he got a fair deal at all. Um, I mean, he lost quite a few players of that. Like you said, how important that 97 class was. You know, you lose that class and. 23 you know, seniors. One, you've, you've lost a lot of seniors. You've lost a lot that have played and a lot of experience. And it just so happened to be that that, that was a, a class that a lot of guys played and, and started and made an impact. And so you got to replace that. Um, we weren't very, you know, uh, Jamal uh, was, you know, uh, the quarterback and he was very athletic and strong. And But we weren't very deep at quarterback. You know, when we started, we didn't get very deep at running back either, you know. So, um you know, not that he, well, he definitely shouldn't have got let go. I just think that there's, you know, something brewing that a lot of people don't know about that I don't even know about that got him out of there. I don't know what it was. Honestly, I've never heard the story about, you know, why Peterson had it out for Solich or something. I just, I don't, I don't know the story. Um, but I do think that, it, you know, it, in a perfect, perfect situation, I think Coach Solich kept, keeps this program intact and, and, goes out on top, you know, after a, you know, a 25 year coaching career in Nebraska, kind of like T.O. And then, and then you wiggle in Scott Frost, you know, after that. And, and, and it's a better transition because the program is in better shape. Mm. So, I mean, just all, after the Frank Solich curse, after they let him go, it's just been really tough. I mean, I, I, I will credit Bo for winning nine games a year and doing some good stuff though. I mean, Bo, Bo held it together pretty nicely for Nebraska for the years that he was here. So, um, but then again, you know, you get caught in between this, you know, athletic directors not getting along with the head coaches or there's something going on and you know maybe maybe too much um of people involved in the program that shouldn't be involved making these tough decisions so sometimes i feel like that can be the case yeah do you, do you feel like the i know a lot of people felt like the option you just had to move away from that it, you know the, the 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 offense was outdated or whatever but at the same time like nebraska decided to do that just a few years after you had him in a national championship game. Do you think mm -hmm. that the, you know, if Frank's stuck around, we understand he evolved his offense at Ohio. It would have evolved a bit, but I mean, do you think that the option, uh, they could have kept that around for a few. Oh, uh, there's no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. I think they just would have went in the shotgun and, and kind of just done some, you know, different things out of the shotgun. Um, as well as underneath, I think we just would have transitioned slowly into more of a spread type of situation zone read. Um, you know, we were doing some of that my senior year. And I really enjoyed it. I think, you know, being in shotgun was, uh, was amazing for me because for many, many years I'd worked, you know, under center and, and you got to make quick, quick decisions and, and get off the line. And, and, you know, your angles are downhill reading guys. So it's real hard to turn your back to a fullback uh, and, and still keep an, an idea. It's almost like you got to feel things more than you got to see them. Mm. Um, and when you get back to shotgun, it's more like, man, I can kind of see everything now. Um so anyway, I think that would evolve. It would evolve at some point. You, Eric, you're running. The play is 32 option. And Pull the guard out of tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tight. Let's say tight right. 32 option. Okay, so it's a, it's an option to the right, guys. Fullback is running <clears throat> to the two hole. He's going. It's it's not a. It's most people think that he's riding the fullback through. He's not. It's just a put fake it. We're mm -hmm. acting like we're riding it, right? Yep. Yep. And then it's option yep. game. I want you to talk through your reads and what are you thinking? I think first thing is, you know, when it comes to reads, you know, Milt Teniper was so good as an offensive line coach of, of teaching me, you know, during practice, because he'd have the script and he'd be running the group. And so teaching me like, okay, which way is better to go? Is it a shade or is it a three technique, you know, or is it an inside eye, you know, two technique? depending on what play we're running. Cause I mean, if you're pulling a guard and you got a, and you've got an inside two technique on your guard, then that's probably not a good play because you're pulling him and it just gives that guy lined up on him a chance to just, you know, get in the hole fast. So you may have to change the play or go to the, you know, go to the other side. Two so we were, opposite. Yeah. Two opposite. We were pretty good at knowing which way was best. Um, because <laughs> number one, the play sucks if you don't get it in the right play, right? Like if you don't call it the right way, you know it's not going to work. So why are we doing it? And so a lot of it had to do with the the, the off the, the defensive front that we saw, or where the linebackers were positioned. And so that that's kind of your first read. You know, walking up to the line and seeing where guys are lined up and things of that nature. 
And then at the, at the snap, you know, you're doing your thing, your footwork and on 32, 38 option, uh, you, you just reversed out, you know, you reversed out, you're reading your fullback. So your fullback was coming through guard was pulling, pull, um, you know, your backside guard was pulling and you had your read with your fullback and he, he, he'd hit it. It's not actually you're reading, you're pulling guard. And that's the, that's the, butt you want to find because he's either going to kick out. If he kicks out quarterbacks coming underneath it. Right. And, and it's just all about a matter of, 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 of feel and reading and seeing what's going on. And then when you come underneath it, this is where I got good at Miller North, where they would teach you get, you know, get back out to the hash marks and the boundary so you could pitch the ball late. Mm. But if you try to cut back, you know, if you cut back, you lose your back. Right. He's gone, right? So the idea of, and then also if you cut back, where's everybody at? They're there, they're, all the guys are following you right there. So we were always taught to, to come underneath that block and then get back to the hash get back to the boundary and get back to the sideline so you could hit a big play or pitch the ball late. And uh, a lot of people don't understand the reasons why we tried to get to the sideline. Yeah. Split second decisions though. You know, you're reading all of these things on the fly. Boom, boom, boom. I seen one time where you, you got it up the field and you did exactly that, kicked it back out and then pitched it late. Yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah. Do you think the option will work in today's game? I do. Yeah, me too. I do. I, th I think it would be, I mean, well, we had it work before. I think that teams would just be so it, it, it just like they were always, why do we got to prepare for this? And then it can never could. So the problem, the reason why it was so effective is because teams, they didn't, they, they, one week they got to prepare for it. You can't prepare for the option in one week. I mean, now if somebody's known what they're doing, they're good. I mean, we, we got teams every week because of that. You know, they tried a different lineup. They would try, you know, the, the, the Oki look where they, you know, left the middle open and have all their linebackers outside because they knew you weren't running an option up the middle. So they try to get their eye linebackers to the outside and they try to make it difficult for blocking. But man, tell you what, it I'd love to see it come back. And I mean, honestly, it could come back in a different form, um, whether it was, you know, in shotgun, I think it could be pretty effective. Get a fullback and a tight end in there and you shift them around and you run out of gun. And I don't know. I think that'd be sweet. 